I'd like to introduce um, the panelists before I do my little introductory spiel. Again, I'm Avi Lewis uh, from The Leap, and this webinar is about um, from scarcity to sovereignty food in a time of pandemic. And we're going to talk about food justice and the crises and opportunities in the food system uh, in, in the time of this pandemic and connecting it to work that's been going on for a long time uh, that our, many of our panelists have been uh, engaged in. So let me introduce folks uh, going around first, and, and then we'll get to the conversation. First, Don, I want to introduce you. Uh, Don is of Shakwakwak ancestry and is the founder curator of the Working Group on Indigenous Food Sovereignty. Don's work on, the, on decolonizing research and relationships is focused on creating a critical pathway of consciousness that shines a light on the cross-cultural interface where Indigenous food sovereignty meets social justice, climate change, and regenerative food systems, research, action, policy, planning, and governance. Welcome, Don. Mm -hmm. All of that and the connections among. Uh, Evelyn Ancalada is a founding member and organizer with Justicia for Migrant Workers, advocating for migrant workers and their families' full immigration status and for a humane global food chain. Evelyn is also an assistant professor in labor studies at Simon Fraser University. Hi, Evelyn. Thanks for coming. Hello. Hi, everybody. Uh, Paul Taylor is an anti-poverty activist and the executive director of Food Share Toronto, one of Canada's largest food justice organizations. Uh, last October, he ran to be the member of parliament in his community of Parkdale High Park. Hi, Paul. Oh, you're muted, but that's okay. Webinar protocols will kick in momentarily. No Thank teasing. you. There you go. No teasing, Paul, about the haircuts. Um, <laughs> and finally, another adorable friend of mine, Raj Patel, who is a research professor in the LBJ School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas in Austin. Wow. I didn't know you were that. Uh, Raj is also a senior research associate at the Unit for Humanities at Rhodes University. The guy has written six books, which I find um, intimidating, uh, and studies the world food system and alternatives to it. Hi, Raj. Hey, Avi. Thanks for having me here. Um, so the, the LEAP, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with our organization, is, is an organization that came out of the LEAP Manifesto in 2015. Our shorthand version of explaining the LEAP Manifesto is it was kind of a Green New Deal 1.0. And this webinar about food and the food system is part of a, a project that we launched in the midst of the pandemic called the People's Bailout. The People's Bailout Project for the LEAP has sort of a threefold impetus, and this is my way of describing it, recognizing the political and cultural opening of the pandemic, that we are in a historic moment of massive change, and seeing a need to amplify and push emergency political demands and reforms that can lead to transformative change that we know we need. So we have been engaged in kind of mapping demands from frontline groups and organizations um, to a longer story arc of relief in the emergency, recovery as there are huge political battles over massive stimulus spending by governments around the world, and reimagining uh, the transforming of, of, of our economy and society. Today, I think particularly, I'm struck by the fact that this pandemic isn't going anywhere, and we have both more crisis to deal with in the day-to-day, -day, but also from a political advocacy point of view, more time than we thought to make the case and build power behind the systemic changes that this crisis is, is calling on us to make. So we've done initial work in the People's Bailout Project on the peoplesbailout.ca um, with a broad range of allies and partners on work and health and housing. And today we are seizing our revolutionary laser pointer and pointing it at food. Um, so what I wanna do initially is talk about the pandemic and and how it's been in an odd, uh, horrible, and, and kind of uh, vulnerability-inducing way, a teacher. We're learning things about our societies um, and our pathways in this pandemic. Um, the, the concrete example that strikes me is the thing about class sizes, as there's debates going on in major industrialized countries about returning to school in September. Uh, it's becoming clear that a class size of like 12 or 15 kids is about the only safe configuration for education. 12 to 15 kids in a class is pretty much what decades of research and educational activism has been calling for, saying that we need smaller class sizes. So the pandemic is telling us 
what in some ways we already knew and what we can now no longer avoid. So I want to try to map this to food and, and bring your voices um, into this conversation. Paul, I want to start with you. Do you want to highlight for us one big lesson you feel the pandemic has taught us about our food system? And we'll have a brief first go around and then we'll have a little more time in the rest of the discussion to, to go deeper. And we might have to unmute you. Sorry about there that. I, I guess two things, actually, if I may, that really jump out at me. One, that food insecurity is a huge issue in this country. And I think we've spent a long time trying to position charity as a solution, and it is ineffective at, at solving the issues of food insecurity and poverty. And then also looking at who bears the brunt of the impact of this virus, you know, really exposes how pervasive white supremacy and systemic racism is in this country. Um, Evelyn, do you want to pick up on that and talk about a lesson that you feel the pandemic has made unavoidable for us? Yes, um, uh, for us at Justice for Migrant Workers, uh, we have seen that the pandemic has highlighted how Canada has relied on basically systemic racism to operate our food system in Canada and how in the moments when we expected and have demanded that migrant workers and their families are considered as full-fledged human beings, they are not. So right now, as we're speaking, there are migrant workers who are starving. Imagine the people that produce our food are right now starving in a so-called first world country like Canada. So for us, it's been a lesson on corporate greed and how it continues to drive food production in Canada and globally. I saw some of those photographs of the kind of meals that migrant workers in lockdown or even those who are sick with COVID are being delivered. And they're like child-sized portions of offensively bland uh, food. And, and these are the folks that our entire food system rests on and they are denied access to proper housing and healthcare, which is how they got sick. And then they're handed these insulting uh, meals. It's, yeah. Exactly, and then the food is left on the floor, which is, you know, for many of our cultures, that's yeah. a sin that you don't do that to food. You show respect, and it's a way of showing respect for the people who are going to eat that food. And mm. it's nowhere near adequate, nor culturally appropriate either for the migrant workers that come from a different, different array of countries from all over the global south. Mm -hmm. Don, what's a lesson that the pandemic you feel has taught us about the food system? I feel that the the COVID nineteen has uh, is a call out from nature uh, to take a really hard look at what we're doing in um, this system um, where this white supremacist narrative of agriculture and how it has led to the decline of health of humans and ecosystems and animals. Um, where you know um, viruses and illness are manifested um, in our bodies, in ourselves, and in our land and food system, and it's also given an opportunity to sit and to reflect on many, many years of of indigenous leadership and what that looks like in a dismantling a structural racism and the systemic injustices. Uh, because there will be no justice on stolen land. And basically, um, the, the COVID has given us time to sit in and look at, uh, learn to work in complexity, because I think to address the issues of coloniality, climate change, and the climate crisis, among a major public health crisis, um, which is a manifestation of all three of the three C's as Naomi Klein names it. And um, really what that indigenous leadership looks like and the significant role we play um, to address a lot of the issues in terms of systems change. And um, the, cri the crisis, the COVID has uh, uh, challenged us though and made us look at the burden we carry as indigenous peoples mm -hmm. um, to give that leadership when you look at huge um, corporate corporations who the system favors in consolidating huge scale land and water and infrastructure to, to do exactly what they're doing and to continue that while we're struggling to get a decent irrigation system and tractor 
in our field. Um, within an agriculture centric narrative that we've been forced to adopt when really we're hunters and gatherers and our land and food system is on a much broader ecological scale. So the system of Western science based um, resource management system is really inadequate. And so we've had time to kind of reflect on that and say, well, what would, what would, a, what would a people's bailout look like from an indigenous view? Um, we've done a lot of that good thinking to share, so. Excellent, we will dig into that. Um, thank you, Raj? Um, I'm, I'm dying to hear that, Dawn, because yeah. Yeah, here, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm in occupied Texas on land that was once uh, home to uh, the Apache and the uh, Alabama Cushata tribe of Texas, among many others. Uh, and what I've been struck by is not the, the, so much the opportunity. I wish we were seeing a bit more of the cracking open of uh, the possibilities of change. Um, and although there are some strikes by the, 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 the workers who are at the front line, which I think are terrific. What I'm really struck by is how powerful these corporations are, I mean, particularly here in the, in the United States, where meat companies, for example, are, are managed to, to get from uh, our president uh, ex exceptions to be able to classify their slaughterhouses as uh, essential operations. And uh, through that, managed to put workers, uh, often uh, disproportionately migrant workers, disproportionately women, on the front lines of one of the most insanely dangerous uh, uh, work environments before COVID. Uh, and if you look at all the hotspots, particularly around here in Texas, it's prisons and it's uh, meat sl uh, slaughterhouses uh, that have, have really popped up. Um, and it, it just boggles the imagination uh, how powerful these corporations can be when they're, they're able to sort of curry favor with the government in order to be able to sacrifice workers so that a few more pigs might be uh, exported in, in the case of Texas to China. So I, I've, I've been really quite struck by, I mean, I knew how powerful corporations were, but this is a moment where it's all check and no balance. Uh, in terms of their, you know, their ability to head to the trough. Uh, and uh, pandemic capitalism is, uh, I think, quite terrifying. We, we just lost Evelyn, who will be logging back in momentarily. A uh, couple of quick housekeeping notes while we're waiting for Evelyn to come back. I have been told to speak louder. This is the first in my lifetime and probably the, the fault of my headset. So I will attempt to bellow. And when it, please somebody tell me to back off if it gets annoying, <laughs> okay, I've, but some of the comments are that I'm a little quiet. Uh, there is an alternative, which is that you could just turn on the closed captioning, which we are lucky enough uh, to have. And um, uh, Jody Chan from The Leap is helping with live captioning. There's a, there's a button at the bottom for closed captioning. So if anyone could benefit from that, please make use of that feature. Um, so we are talking about this uh, crisis. And we've said that the food system, uh, all of us in, in our different uh, avenues of work have said that the food system was already in crisis before the pandemic hit. So let's take a moment to explain a little bit more of what we mean by that. What was the nature of the various crises in the food system and how did the pandemic exacerbate them? And obviously you each have different areas of focus and expertise that overlap. Um, in, in that. But Evelyn, you mentioned in your first answer that these, there was already a crisis in the migrant farm, farm working uh, sector. Tell us a little bit more about the pre-existing conditions and how the pandemic impacted them. Okay, well, um, there's obviously colonization, uh, neoliberal um, uh, readjustments or neoliberal restructuring um, through uh, structural adjustment programs that have devastated countries, many uh, rural livelihoods in Jamaica, in Mexico. Um, and these are families that have been farming the lands um, for generations. They have a lot of indigenous uh, knowledge about the land in which they live. And Canada is completely complicit through the signing of the free trade agreement uh, through NAFTA and now um, in its new uh, refurbished form that basically just continues to support uh, corporations, all of these people from the countryside in the global south have lost their jobs. 
So they have already been disciplined by globalization, by neoliberalism to be a source of cheap labor. Um, and so um, Canada, the Canadian government, uh, and of course we could see that many governments of the global, the so-called global north, have captured this labor force as, an, as a, basically an indentured labor force, a disposable labor force, mm. and constructed categories like temporary, like migrant, and undocumented. And that's something that we have to remember that these categories are not neutral, they're state create, created. And depending on the label that you have, you have with you a certain set of rights or you don't. And right now, what is concerning as well, when we think about these labels and the way that migrant workers are held captive by these labels, migrant workers right now, they cannot really speak about the conditions that they're facing because they're caught between a rock and a hard place. Um, them not being in Canada could mean um, basically um, starvation for their families. And them being here could mean them going back to their home countries in a body bag. And so they're risking their lives here to provide for their families. I've been speaking to a lot of migrant workers, how they say that every day they're showing up to work, but also living in their workplaces completely with anxiety and wondering if they're going to make it through this season. And so, um, so basically we have, we have had a food system that has used a group of people as disposable labor and since the beginning, we've been asking for and demanding for status as one way to leverage the power imbalance between employers and the Canadian government and migrant workers. But that still hasn't happened. And now that we, we see that the system is completely broken, it's not broken. This is the way that the system was actually set up. Yeah, set up in exactly this way. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted that you brought that powerful demand for status on arrival for all. And I was so excited to see um, various migrant rights organizers and organizations launch that campaign recently uh, in Canada in the midst of the pandemic. Uh, I think an example as we get into later parts of the conversation of what now feels politically possible that wasn't necessarily before. But before we get that, let's continue to sketch the dimensions of the crisis. Paul, um, it's, it's been uh, gratifying and disturbing to see you in the news a lot recently in food share and associated organizations pointing out the work you'd been doing before the crisis about the racialization of poverty in big mm -hmm. cities like Toronto and food insecurity uh, and black families who have the same incomes who have own homes and stuff like that still being disproportionately likely to be food insecure in Canada you know which prides itself on having a different setup uh, than the United States mm -hmm which may be true in some respects, but in some essential respects, it's not. So give us a little bit more on the pre-existing and the COVID exacerbated crisis from the work that you do. For sure. So, you know, I work at a community food organization and I think going back quite a while, you know, I think in the movement, uh, the food movement, so to speak, um, people acknowledge that 4.4 million Canadians are food insecure. You know, but what we realize is when we report out on the statistics around food insecurity in this country, they don't necessarily speak to or they don't speak to the experiences of folks that are especially vulnerable. So for Food Share, we wanted to dive in, uh, take a deeper dive and actually look at what the experience for black folks was in this country. And it, and it, it was eye opening in so many ways. You know, initially we found, you know, black Canadians are three and a half times more likely to be food insecure than, than white Canadians. We found that 12% of um, white children live in food insecure households versus 36% of black children. You know, those are startling enough, but what we found after that really spoke to how this is an issue. And first of all, I should say, when we're talking about 4.4 million folks in, in, who are living in food insecure households, that's equal to the cities of populations of Calgary and Toronto combined. So this was a crisis uh, already especially so for black Canadians. Here are some of the things that we learned. And first, you know, when we saw those numbers, we tried to tease ev anything out possible to try and understand what was happening, what was causing this. We look at household composition and found that it didn't matter if it was a single parent household, dual parent household, prevalence remained high. We looked at things like immigration status, it didn't matter if someone was born in, a black person was born in Canada or born abroad, again, the prevalence remained high. We also looked at things like um, home ownership, which you referenced. And I think we generally understood in this country that when someone owns a home, they're less likely to be food insecure. Not true for black Canadians. So actually black uh, homeowners in this country 
are pretty much um, uh, just as food insecure, same levels of food insecurity as white renters in this country. So really, you know, and I could go on with some of these stats, I won't do that, but really what this underpins for me is that folks in the food movement or, or, or doing work around food advocacy who have long positioned some, uh, especially white-led or large white-led organizations who have been unwilling to engage in conversations about systemic racism, around anti-black racism, anti-indigeneity. Those are the things that need to be centered in this work moving forward. And that's what this laid bare for us. Um, and, and the pandemic, certainly, you know, we know that black Canadians are, are um, more affected than, than uh, white folks right now. I know because I've been reading and following in the papers that you've been um, one of the organizations leading an effort to just get food to people um, who need it in the pandemic. Can you give us a quick uh, peek into that reality of the work, the emergency work that you've been doing? Because I think you, sure. we can see that you connect it to the systemic uh, analysis and solutions. Yeah, so we, we, we never imagined that we'd be giving out uh, free food. It's not a part of our model. Uh, there are other groups that do that. Um, but we realized that a lot of those organizations that required people to come to them, whether it's food banks, that sort of thing, uh, food pantries, were having challenges, obviously, uh, uh, welcoming folks. So we said, we've got a model where we're able to distribute boxes of fresh produce to folks. So we started raising money. But I think the most important thing that we did was partner with organizations that work with communities uh, that are that we know are the most vulnerable and were before uh, COVID-19. So working with groups like the Workers Action Center, working with um, Black Lives Matter, working with in, an Indigenous queer group. So 80, 80 groups across the city who we just said, there's no application. We want to, you tell us who to send this fresh produce to, and we will deliver it to their homes, you know, and that's been really important. And I think an opportunity for us to build some key relationships as this work moves forward. Because as you've, as you've said, you know, um, this is one element of the work, the emergency piece, but there, this is exposed uh, systems that are in desperate need of change. So we look forward to working with these groups to, to do that as well, to advance that work as well. Don, I, I feel like you wanna jump in. You started, you started uh, in our, our conversation, we're talking about the pandemic as a kind of message from mother nature. Um, do you want to talk in, in some of those terms about the crisis that pre-existed this pandemic? Yes, well, um, prior to the pandemic, we as Indigenous peoples, well, all throughout colonization have, have witnessed drastic changes to the health and well-being of the land, the water, the people, the plants and the animals that provide us with our food. The climate crisis um, we know we have stories, we have oral history, we have um, um, memories within the elders who are still alive, who have seen the changes within their lifetime, even myself, um, remembering swimming in the river or the lakes and feeling so pure and clean that you could see the bottom of a really deep lake and you, you just can't see that anymore. And, um, we know that as uh, hunters and fishers and gatherers um, in this part of the world and an estimated two-thirds of all Indigenous peoples in so-called North America um, are hunters and gatherers and hunters and gatherers are among the, the oldest living memory of what it means to live sustainably on this planet. Hunters and gatherers have been here for 90% of the time that humans have been here. And it's because of the model of economy in large part, um, the subsistence, the giving, the sharing, the trading, the cooperation. We know that during COVID there was global networks of mutual aid that popped up all over the place and people started planting gardens and you almost, you couldn't buy seeds in the store anymore because so many people realized, oh wow, we can't rely on the, the corporations anymore. And we, we have to plant a garden and we have to work together and we have to help each other and we have to provide help to those who don't have food. And um, so, so I think really looking at um, the model of economy and recognizing that the Western science, you know, is part of a solution, but it is not the ultimate voice of truth and reason. And the techno-bureaucratic framework for research and development that has been established 
through colonization in, in BC, in so-called BC, in this part of the world, where there's 27 nations of Indigenous peoples who are still here. We've never surrendered or ceded the title to our land, our water. We still have memories within my lifetime, and I don't consider myself an elder yet, but I can see that we are still realizing our governance and that hasn't died. Um, the knowledge is still there within our original instructions and our genetic blueprint. And so when we think of Western science asserting to be the ultimate voice of truth and reason for governing and policy proposals and planning, it totally falls short. We need a whole new, um, a transition, a just transition that includes social justice around dismantling structural uh, racism that's been instituted in every research and policy and planning and governance institute in this in this place and as well as education um, you know during COVID I heard you say people like class sizes were reduced to 12 to 15 and that's great but for Indigenous peoples we we're unschooling our kids we we don't think that that colonial model of education is actually what we need. We need our children to be spending time with the parents, for the parents to be supported, to move away from a wage economy that forces us to spend less time teaching our children our languages, our culture, our hunting, our fishing, our gathering, our food preservation. Um, and we need to build communities of regenerative practice that support each other in a decolonizing and moving away from a capitalist uh, economy and wage economy. Um, we want to be together. We want to cooperate. We want to be in community. And we have so many social issues in our community. Food insecurity is only one of them. We've got high rates of um, poor mental health, high rates of stress and trauma associated with just my mother was forced into Indian, uh, Indian residential school from the age of five to 14 years old. A year later, she had me. I was born into a memory of trauma, of what it means to be enslaved as a child, what it means to be beaten because you speak your language. Um, and that's just one person in our community. And, and so we're on the front lines, but we're dealing with this and we're dealing with the high rate of drug addiction, where people are so um, so dismayed at this system and the way it separated us from our families and communities, that they feel that attempt to fill the void with drugs and alcohol, and it's rampant and epidemic food-related illnesses, epi um, chronic inflammation, liver disease. These are all a part, very much a part of the food system. Um, so it's, um, yeah, I could go on and on, but I think Western science and its reductionist mindset will not, it, it's not designed to address a complex issue. We must look to indigenous and transition to a regenerative life-giving paradigm and a mindset that is based on a holistic health narrative and indigenous peoples know that we, we still remember that it's still encoded in us and uh, but we need a lot of support and we need to figure out how to even using these communication tools and having capacity for that is is a is something that you know um one way people can support but anyways i won't go into all of the solutions right now but i i just think that a transition a just transition to a regenerative tribal economy informed by indigenous paradigm i see a lot of work happening to transition to a regenerative food system. But I think in a lot of cases, the same as agroecology, it misses the mark on the social justice and the indigenous, the significant role we play. Indigenous people make up only 5% of the world's population, yet we maintain 22% of the world's land mass and 80% of the world's biodiversity. In so-called Canada, we've been allocated through the colonial government only 0.2% of the whole landmass 
how are we supposed to be food sovereign with that when we're placed on Indian reserves that are, that really the system of apartheid in South Africa was modeled after the reservation system in so-called Canada. So these are real glaringly blatant racist kind of system that we're attempting to that I think there's huge opportunity to transition out of, but it really must be centering indigenous leadership and indigenous knowledge. Don't and that's it. not to discount the people of color, because I know that people of color from all over the world were dispossessed from the same global forces. And, and I, uh, so I think capitalism and coloniality is a, a, an experience we share um, globally. So. Don, you're so you're you're so good at making the connections, and the people in the in the chat are cheering. Um, and I, I do want to point out that we have a very lively chat going on, and an audience that, at the very least, stretches from the Gulf Coast, uh, folks in New Orleans to to the far north uh, in Canada, and well beyond. And so I really appreciate the 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 connections and the holistic way uh, that you're approaching these subjects. Um, and Raj, that's a lot of what, what you do in your work. But as we wrap up this round, considering the crisis and how the pandemic um, exploded it, I, I wonder if you could bring in a little bit of the perspective from your work on farming um, and around the world. Um, and some of the, I, I've, I've been uh, really changed by some of your writing on the way that financial systems and 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 this current form of capitalism that we live under has shaped the experience and the and the practice of, of farming. Um, and I'd love I'd love it if you could shine a little light on the crises in the farming system, which Dawn I think has put in a holistic context um, versus uh, hunting and gathering and other conceptions of the food system. But the global food system is a thing, um, and I think in the early days of the pandemic when people um, started to think about whether, whether there would be food shortages in the supermarkets and the phrase supply chain entered the vernacular. People started, you know, worrying about supply chains. For me, it was a teachable moment. Um, so teach us a little bit about what's going on in the food system crisis. Uh, I, I'm not sure that uh, anyone wants to follow Dawn uh, in, in, in thinking through the sort of the, the big picture here. But if, if I can maybe lob it in one idea uh, to, to help sort of pull this all together, it's the idea of debt. Debt is what it is that uh, you know, communities of people of, of color uh, in, in colonized countries uh, have figured out ways to, to navigate and negotiate and survive through the kinds of mutual aid that Paul was talking about. Uh, and the, 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 the systems of debt uh, that deeply impact farmers, uh, whether in the United States or in Canada or uh, uh, you know, in, in the global south, are remarkably similar because the corporations that administer them are remarkably similar. Uh, and if you're you know, interested in the, the sort of lock-in for the paradigm that we're in at the moment, debt is sort of front and center because as soon as uh, farmers on occupied land or on land that they farm for generations uh, start falling into debt, then the pressure is on to, to fall into the paradigm of industrial agriculture, uh, not because it is a better paradigm, but, but because it offers some pathway out of debt uh, without default and without losing the land on which, uh, you know, which your, your family has, has been attached for, for generations. Uh, and the, uh, it, it seems to me that this is the, one of the bonds that needs to be sundered in any future agricultural system is uh, the link between how uh, indebted farmers find themselves making horrific decisions for them and their families uh, deploying the agrotoxins uh, and the industrial monocultures of uh, large-scale agriculture even if they know that they themselves wouldn't eat any of this stuff in their worst nightmares uh, but they must do it in order to satisfy the bank and to satisfy the debt that has been imposed by the World Bank or the International Monetary Fund, and to, uh, to make it possible uh, to perhaps save enough money to send a, a, you know, a, a child off to school. Um, these kinds of 
uh, excruciating short-term decisions in the hope of some sort of long-term better outcome uh, are the, the crushes that industrial agriculture forces, far, forces farmers into. So, uh, I mean, I, I think if we look across the world in this moment, uh, we see debt as the, you know, the, the master's tool. Um, and whether that's the debt that's being wielded over small scale farmers in the global north or south, uh, to be able to, you know, to, shunting them into one form of production away from sustainability, or whether it's the kind of debt that's wielded by private equity firms and by uh, you know, the, the G20 countries bilaterally, uh, you see countries in the global south suffering and selling off their land, even if it's not their land, uh, which, you know, and again, thank you, Dawn, for bringing up again and again the fact that that land was never these states to give away, and nonetheless, they do it. Uh, th that uh, impulse to, to bring in, uh, you know, capital from China or from Wall Street or wherever it is in order to pay off the debt, that is driving industrial agriculture even deeper in this moment of COVID. And uh, I think if we are to, to be able to take the step back uh, away, you know, building on the, the traditions of mutual aid and mutual support that we're starting to, to build now, um, that debt has to end. It, you know, a dozen years ago, there was a, a global financial crisis where a lot of us learned for the first time that debt had been itself commodified, that the debts of mortgages had been packaged and sliced and diced and resold, um, and that there was a debt in a bubble, right? That, it, that people were making money off of other people's debts. And this, in the, in the intervening years, there's been a financialization of land and of farmland around the world. And Raj, if you can just speak a little bit to that, I think it's important to understand the crisis that you brought to really human terms about the choices that farm families need to make. But one of the big barriers is farms are getting bigger and bigger. You need a lot of money to buy land. Private equity vulture firms are buying up land <laughs> and speculating on it. And, and the whole thing is about profits rather than feeding people. That, I mean, so that's more my brutal reductionist uh, version of it. But can you fill in some of the blanks around how debt is playing out in, in, in how food gets produced? Well, I mean, j just very quickly, I mean, uh, the, the excellent academic Madeleine Fairbairn has, has talked about land as like gold with yield. Uh, and uh, land is now just another investment class. Uh, and it, it provides uh, the, the kinds of return that, uh, you know, other assets may go up and down, uh, but land produces food and it, so you, you can buy and sell it, but it also provides that, that interest. Uh, and, the, you know, the, the interest comes from uh, the transformation of farmer as someone who is connected to their land uh, into someone who is a, a debt peon. Uh, uh, so someone who exists to be able to uh, maintain their, you know, just a, a sort of fing fingernail hold on the land by uh, following the most lucrative uh, return path. Uh, and even if that return path is uh, mining the soil for its fertility and poisoning people downstream and, uh, you know, very carbon intensive and polluting the air, uh, it doesn't, you know, the, 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 what matters is being able to hang on by your fingernails. And so again, Debt becomes this mechanism through which uh, the, you know, the, the the land is turned into an asset that generates its yield. But this is, I mean, I, I, this is why I'm so concerned with the idea of what comes next. Because uh, if we're interested in, you know, a sort of decolonizing approach to this debt, then it can't merely be a, a sort of land to the tiller moment. If we are to take Dawn's call for the rematriation of land seriously. If, if land is to be rematriated, if we are to have uh, a transformative relationship to uh, the indigenous communities that still live and thrive uh, on, uh, in and around this alienated land, then what's the relationship between, for example, sustainable farmers and uh, indigenous communities? I mean, I think if we're interested in, in the, you know, if, let's imagine the debt goes away, what comes next after that? I'd like to jump in here. Please. So, um, you know, I, I've been an activist the better part of my life. I think I was born into it by nature of being the eldest survivor of intergenerational impacts of Indian residential school. Um, 
And my journey of self-realization um, through my meditation and my fellowship of natural spiritual healing through the meditation center I practice at, that aligns very uh, well with my Shakwatmukh and my indigenous teachings of Kanuchen Stut, Kwaseltan Aos. Kanuchen Stut means take care of yourself first. Only when you can take care of yourself and you're not a burden to the tribe, then you can give to others. And it encourages that, of course. Tribal values is sharing and giving and cooperating. It's never about the individualism. It's individuality. And I think these are important concepts because in activism, I feel, especially in, and this isn't to, uh, disrespect any of our, our white settler friends and allies, many of whom are showing up in the most gracious way to support and really looking at how to unpack their white privilege, their white fragility, and really what does it mean to dismantle a white supremacist narrative. Um, ultimately, it's best done by Indigenous people and people of color to do it for ourselves and by ourselves, but we can't do it alone. And we saw what happened in South Africa um, when the Rainbow Nations, um, as Desmond Tutu and Nelson Mandela coined that term, and back in the 1960s in the US, the Rainbow Coalitions, um, the people like Black Panthers and the Red Berets and, um, and uh, different people of all colors, uh, poor working class white people mobilized under that, that term, Rainbow Coalitions. And, um, and so the, um, the ability to come together, the need to come together with people of all colors is important. But it's really interesting what happens um, with um, how so many of us have been colonized and kind of internalized a lot of the colonial ways. We all have. We've all been impacted by it. Um, and the, I think for Indigenous uh, leadership to, to really be able to uh, center a narrative. Um, and when I think about debt and I think about capitalism and um, when I think about um, responding to the WTO and responding to um, the big corporations who even in my own territory, you know, are coming in and buying up huge tracts of land and extracting huge amounts of water and, and um, the time spent responding to that versus the time spent mobilizing the knowledge and the networks, the people, power, and really trusting and validating and building legitimacy in the grassroots voices where the real knowledge lives. Because I'm not convinced that responding to any of what thing to do with capitalism or talking to neoliberalists is actually what we need to do. I, I don't know that we're going to change much that way. I feel like we need to build legitimacy and the people power and grow our own food. If you have a backyard, if you don't have a backyard, lobby your, your parks board in the cities and decolonize the land in the parks, grow food. We're doing it in Vancouver. I'm happy to say the city of Van the Vancouver Parks Board where has awarded us a residency, our working group on Indigenous food sovereignty in Strathcona Park, one, a very historical park with a long history of social justice and activism um, with Hogan's Alley and uh, a big Asian community. And, um, and so they've accepted our vision to restore Indigenous food lands um, into their capital planning budget of 2022 to 2026. So there are always allies, There's, um, and even if it's in your municipal government, I think that's a good place to start to build legitimacy and to really look at how to decolonize and how to work with people of all colors and develop that decolonial anti-racist framework and organize gatherings and, and um, mobilize, which Paul and I have been doing work together on that and, and our we'll be announcing an upcoming event in the fall. But um, yeah, I think just there's lots we can do, even though it seems this capitalism 
seems so overwhelming. It seems a little big. It does seem yeah. a little big. Um, well, I want to I want to carry through. We're, we're already kind of starting to run out of time, and um, I want to take where you've brought us on, and 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 pivot to some of the demands that are coming up, um, specifically around food and food workers, um, in all of the dimensions that we've been discussing, um, a result of these centuries of the construction of the system under which we now live, um, and some of the ways out. And I think Don, you've already eloquently put the need to bring struggles together, to bring people together around the things that really connect us. Um, and so Evelyn, I want to bring your voice back into this um, in talking about the, the, the people, the most invisible uh, and the essential uh, workers in the food system currently. And I was so thrilled that you started with the global trade system and the way that campesinos and peasant farmers around the world have been displaced through trade policies and through uh, and through colonial uh, neoliberal trade deals uh, and end up as migrant workers in, other, in, in richer countries. Um, and now we have this call for status for all and other specific demands that bring together for me some of the key elements of, of a response and invite other movements in to those struggles and connect the dots. So let's talk a little bit about solutions that you and others in your space are proposing. Uh, firstly, um, when I was this, uh, listening to um, to Don and Rush, I kept on thinking about the com commodification of migrant workers and their lives and their bodies and their senses, and um, how sometimes the migrant rights movement has used the language of neoliberalism, like for instance, saying, "Oh, but they contribute to the economy," to assert their worth. But then that's a way of further commodifying. Um, you know, the people that are part of our community. Um, so we definitely want to stay away from that. And we're beyond right now, you know, writing endless policy reports because it's all about mobilizing. So wherever the state is not, wherever the state abandons, then community takes over. And when, we, when, we, when I think about community, I'm talking about transnational community. So now... Um, Yes, I'll get to some of the solutions that we're dreaming, and that's how solutions start by imagining the possible and making that what we thought was impossible actually possible. Right now, where where we are at is a, a political moment for possibilities now more than ever. It is now that we are the closest to status, and um, whenever the government has not presented itself, community has presented itself, transnational communities. So I also wanted to share that um, FoodShare is one of our partners that has been helping us deliver food to migrant workers, primarily in the GTA area um, and also in the Simcoe area, but um, also delivering this food, it's almost like you're in a criminal mission. You have to be careful of where you leave the food. I mean, migrant workers have been subjected to all of these horrible farm rules um, with even security companies um, regulating the behavior of of uh, migrant workers in the premises of uh, in the private property where they're supposed to live under you know the the contracts that they sign that are all legal um, within Canadian law, and now we're seeing that more forcefully and um, and even just recently, two migrant workers in British Columbia were deported, were sent back to Mexico for receiving activists who came to visit them. Um, to make sure that they were okay to do a visit, like the visits we all do, to make sure that migrant workers are okay. So now they're being held captive more than ever. So what I see is, um, aside from status, is you know really enforce the right to mobility. Um, these are migrant workers and families that have organized around this migration for generations. So um, and they have built their livelihoods not just solely focusing on one national economy we cannot conceive of workers or work working right now nationally it's we are all um connected globally and we could see that more so with food more than ever now mm -hmm. and so um but i think also our conversations and our demands for status we have to have more conversations with the indigenous peoples and nations that have always been here to see what that actually could look like and i also want to press for that ancestral generational knowledge that every migrant worker embodies and the way that they adapt their knowledge also to different processes. Um, and I have to say too that many times when I go to rural Ontario, sometimes 
I will see that migrant workers have a plot of land where they um, cultivate their jalapenos or other culturally appropriate food. And the way that they talk about or they engage with that plot of land is very different and more humane and more interconnected than the way that they work in a greenhouse where they, you know, where all these chemicals are sprayed. So we have to go back to that. And uh, we have to fight for food production to truly be in the hands of the people because we cannot trust corporations to feed us, let alone um, to treat the people that are part of the production of the food that we all depend on to treat them ethically because we've, we know that they won't. And constantly in our work, we hit that main wall, that corporate greed, the, you know, the market and how the market is supreme, how produce and profit are always placed be, um, before the lives of migrant workers and their families. So I'd rather focus on that. I, I wanna um, you know, think more about what Don has said and see how we can uh, focus on the knowledge that is already there that always gets devalued and that always gets sidelined and erased. And that's the knowledge that we have to come back to. So beautiful. Um... Paul, you know, we're, we're, we're launching the next uh, piece of the People's Bailout Project with some of the demands uh, coming from food, uh, from food justice organizers. And we've been consulting with many of you around, you know, what are the things that we're calling for in the crisis? And how do we use them as organizing tools and coalition building moments to accelerate the political momentum that seems possible now? in the crisis to longer term structural changes. And you and I have had this conversation in, in, in the collaboration between the Leap and Food Share, where it's like, where you keep saying, you know, people need money. <laughs> we can't, like you can't solve a food problem just with food. As long as we're still in capitalism, people need basic, whether it's a guaranteed annual income or, 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 or a jobs guarantee, there needs to be an economic rebalancing for people to have access to food, which should be more expensive if it's grown in healthier ways and workers are paid appropriately and farm workers have rights and the right to unionize and all of these things. So let's speak a little bit about some of the structural changes from your point of view, Paul, that are required and, and where you see possibilities in this moment, which, is, which does seem quite fertile as it also seems dire. You know, I think uh, you, you said such an important word that I think is really important as we think about what needs to happen. And I, rights. You know, I think we really need to center uh, whatever we call for in advancing uh, human rights, you know, as opposed to what I think we do sometimes is we cling on to one policy and we say that's the thing. Um, but I think we need to look at a, a framework that's based on a human rights framework uh, that allows for a decent standard of living for all. So. Yes, we need things like a minimum income floor, uh, a basic income, but we also need progressive labor laws. We need a guarantee of a basket of publicly provided services. Like, you know, you look at what people are spending a lot of money on often. It's childcare. And we know that investments in childcare, you know, those are green jobs, you know? So th those are the jobs of the future. So we need, we need to guarantee things like uh, access to childcare, access to affordable housing for all. We need to, do things that, like looking at education. Um, and for those that choose to engage with it, it should be free from public, uh, from, from um, you know, kindergarten right up to post-secondary. I really think what we do so often is we really allow ourselves to engage in these conversations about either or, uh, is it basic income, is it services? I reject the politics of either or. You know, what I'm really interested in, what's truly possible and what's truly needed. And those are the things that we should be aiming for. The only other thing I want to add is I've been thinking about this a little bit more as I look, look at um, uh, statistics and information and hear stories about food insecurity, you know. It's reminded me that what we need is a healthcare system that actually goes beyond sick care. You know, we can't have a healthcare system that's divorced from things like access to affordable food, access to recreation centers and other health promoting uh, spaces. You know, those are the solutions that I think for so long we've been convinced are radical. Um, but that's not radical. I think what's radical is uh, making it legal for billionaires to extract wealth the way that they have and funnel it into their tax havens. You know, it's time for that stuff to end. And let's start actually advancing what's possible in this country and driving a, a, people's, a people's agenda. This is beautiful that we're talking about 
solutions to a food uh, access to food crisis, and you're talking about healthcare and education, and and obviously the the climate crisis and responses to the climate crisis and economy based on care, valuing care for the earth and each other. To take uh, words that appeared in the in the Leap Manifesto five years ago is. Is, is clearly the level that we need to be talking about. There are some interesting policy things, not to privilege one over others, but uh, for instance, there's this Nourish uh, uh, program that tries to bring uh, locally produced healthy food to hospitals. Why should hospital food be so crappy when there are local food producers all around who can be connected to the healthcare system and also you know, lower emissions and pollution and waste. And so these uh, solutions that actually speak to a multidimensional approach, solving lots of problems uh, at one go, and actually acknowledging that we face crises that are, that are intertwined and we need solutions that intersect. Paul. Can I just say one more thing? I'd be remiss if I didn't say this. As I, as I think about basic income, I recognize, you know, we've all acknowledged the impact that white supremacy has on uh, shaping so much of the discourse. And I think basic income is unequivocally, you know, it's a tool in the, in the tool belt that we need to be advancing. But I think it's a privilege to solely advocate for basic income. It really doesn't acknowledge the, the, the multi uh, generations of lost opportunity, health impacts, um, and all of those pieces. So we need to be talking about basic income alongside uh, reparations and meaningful conversations around reparations. Excellent. You're coming back for the basic income debate because I've been itching <laughs> to have that one for a few years. Now it seems urgent. Um, Raj, I want to come to you as we as we come to uh, a close in our in our brief time together. And I just want to touch one other note um, that I hope you can respond to. One of the things about food is its uh, spiritual dimension, and it's the intimacy of food. Evelyn, you've spoken beautifully about what food means to workers who are displaced. Uh, Dawn, your work on food sovereignty is, is all about the centrality of food uh, in a spiritual system. And, you know, the recipes, the food is how your, your grandparents uh, give you something that you can ca carry forward and pass on. It's how we know who we are. And there have been moments in this pandemic where I feel like people have definitely found comfort in food and a lot of comfort food. <laughs> um, and this is one of the ways, the central ways that we take care of each other. One of the things that makes food justice activism such a foundational and intersectional uh, um, praxis. But Raj, can you speak a little bit um, when we think about solutions and, and, and the, the political moment that we're in, the opportunities that there are to connect with food on, on a different level? Um, to connect the politics of it to the, you know, because we've gone very big in this conversation and I want to stay big and bring it to the table at the same time. Um, one of the, the things that I've been noticing in my engagements with movements is, uh, I mean, if, if you go to a Black Lives Matter protest, for example, here in the United States, people are having fun. Uh, I mean, there are obviously there are some dark moments. We've had one particularly dark moment here in Austin uh, just a few days ago. But the, the protests are also spaces for joy. And uh, that joy, it seems to me, is a spillover of movement time. Uh, you know, in every social movement that I've been a part of, the deliberations uh, often you know, at someone's house over a table go late into the night and there are children running around and then they fall asleep and, you know, and then we, you know, we, we dance and we sing and there is love in that moment. And food is constitutive, not just of, uh, of uh, the moment, but of who we are and how it is that we be together in new ways. Um, and that movement time is stretching out into the streets. Uh, and food is, you can't have movement time without the cooking time, without the, the moments, the, the, the long process of social reproduction that happens that keeps movements going. This isn't the sort of time where you sit around uh, and you're in a seminar and you're learning something. This is movement time when you're building and creating love together that's embodied in the food. And uh, when I think about the challenges that lie ahead, particularly, and I, I, I I really don't want to respect Paul's idea of, of reparations. Uh, these are going to be difficult conversations, but movement time allows those conversations to happen uh, over food. And 
uh, and I'm, I'm excited for, for us to be having more movement time together uh, that requires the corporeal joy of food uh, and the joy of cultures admixed in ways that respect the land and the time and the labor, particularly women's labor and women's knowledge that's embodied in that food so that we can imagine the world better. Wow. I'm getting hungry for lunch. It's lunchtime here on the uh, Pacific. Um, Dawn, you I, want a last word? Sure. Yes, yeah, just because of I'm course. so inspired by what Raj said and and I feel deeply within me that like I was resonating with it so deeply that um, I just want to say that um, the very first principle of Indigenous food sovereignty is the sacred responsibility, even more so than a right. It's a responsibility to to um, ourselves, to the, the land, the water, the people, the plants, the animals that provide us with our food. And, you know, food is, we eat it, so it becomes us. Like, how much more spiritual can that be? It's the most transformative thing we do every day. We turn our food into us. And the food comes from the land, it comes from the water, it comes from the sunshine. So we are the land, we are the water, we are the sunshine. And it's really sad to know that so many people have become disconnected to that. They go to the grocery store, they actually think that that's the power and we give way too much power to that. Um, gardening, being out in the forest, picking berries, not that I'm professing, you know, like suggesting everybody go pick berries and go hunt or fish because there's not enough left even for the indigenous people. And I think there's, it, it's becoming too dominated, those practices by privileged white people who can afford to go and buy a big fancy truck and go up the mountain, pick all the huckleberries and the, the grizzly bears are starving. Um, and we're starving, um, some of our people in our community. And so, but yeah we are the food and i think feeling into that just within our own bodies as 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 people is really deep and it's hard work it is it is the work it's on ourselves and so um going out into the protests into a community and building that love that raja was speaking to it starts with us really wow um, you guys are brilliant. This was an incredible conversation. I feel really, really blessed and honored uh, to have been part of, of, of this and uh, really meaningful. We had such an active, engaged audience of almost 500 folks uh, and many more who will see it afterwards. So Evelyn, Dawn, Raj, Paul, thank you so much for joining us. We'll watch for the People's Bailout launch uh, at theleap.org in the days to come. And uh, we will post links to, to all of your work as well. Thank you for everything that you're doing.